tonight we begin our Bible study through the book of Genesis. Each week we'll be going through one chapter of the book of Genesis. Uh, my initial book that I chose was Romans when we uh, started the church. And that was because it's a New Testament book and it's a very basic book. Well, I have the same philosophy behind the reason why I chose Genesis. Genesis really is the foundation of the entire Bible. I believe that the King James Bible is perfect, even the point that I believe that the books of the Bible are in a perfect order. And what better way to start out the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There is no book like the Bible. There really is not. The Bible is an amazing book. It is perfect from beginning to end. And this is a great foundational book for us to begin with. The Bible, I believe, that is intended to be a foundational book. The very beginning... We get the story of creation, the beginning of the origin of this universe, the origin of human history, and we see the fall of mankind, the very beginning of the Bible. Then we see the stories of judgment about Noah. We're going to be going through all of this, of course. I want to give you a brief summary. Then we see where God chose out Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. And that is right there where the gospel in clarity begins. And the whole entire Bible from that point forward is pointing towards. Then you see God dealing with Jacob or Israel as a nation from then. So if you don't understand or you have never read the book of Genesis, you're going to be very lost throughout a lot of the Bible. There's a lot of things in the book of Acts and the Apostle preaching that are referring back to the book of Genesis that you would be confused about. This really and truly is the foundational book of the Bible. And it's also a very simple book. I believe that it's a perfect book to begin with. And not only that, there are many interesting stories throughout Genesis. It, it jumps around a lot, and there are so many interesting stories and so many interesting characters. And here in Genesis chapter number 1, what we see is creation, the creation of the entire world. I want to read verse 1 one more time. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now look at chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens... And the earth were finished and all the host of them. So when we look here in Genesis chapter number 1, this is going to be a summary of everything that was created. Every single thing that was created in the beginning of this universe. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, one more time, we'll begin the book. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. One thing I want to point out to you that will become relevant in just a moment is notice that heaven is singular at this point. Just a moment ago we read in heaven's heavens. It was used and it was plural. But it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Take your uh, hand, keep your hand here, and flip over to John 1.1. 1, 1. We're going to compare these two a little bit later in the chapter. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this just because I feel like everybody's pretty sure up on this. But there's a very clear reference to this particular page in the Bible, this particular text in the Bible. In John 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. So notice that clear reference back to Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, where the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We'll get more to that in just a moment. Verse number 2, the Bible says this, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So right here, when we get into Genesis chapter number 1, we read verses 1 and 2, and there's already a false doctrine that has to be combated. There has to be fought even between these two verses right here. And there is, and let me go on record and say this, that our church rejects any form of evolution our, our church rejects, I don't even care if you believe in theistic evolution. That's not biblical. That's not what the Bible teaches. Our church rejects the day-age theory. We reject all of that, and we reject the gap theory. Amen. So right here the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then verse 2 says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then it says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, right? Well, there is a teaching that says that there is a gap between Genesis chapter number 1 and Genesis uh, verse 1 and Genesis chapter number 1 verse number 2. I want you to keep your hand here and we'll look at it quickly and debunk this. Jeremiah chapter number 4 verse number 23. This is their cross reference. Jeremiah chapter number 4 verse number 23. And <clears throat> they cross reference these, these, uh, these two verses together. And just because it uses the same phrase... Without form and void, they say, oh, well, that means here in Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 23, it's talking about the same event, which is a ridiculous logical leap. Just because it uses the same two words, oh, we must be talking about the same event. I could do that in numerous cases where this same group of people that believe in the gap theory, they would not believe that it's speaking of the same event, but I could cross-reference where God just uses the same words to describe the same sort of chaos 
or the same sort of structure. That's all that's going on here. But I want you to look at this here in Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 23. Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 23. The Bible says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens. And then it says this, and they have no light. So right off the bat, when you look at that, you can say, oh, well, that sounds like it's talking about the same thing, right? Well, this is the importance of context, right? Because if you go back to Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 2, it is true that the earth was without form and void and that there was no light, right? That's true, right? Okay, well, I want you to get the context here of what we're talking about, and then we will debunk this. I want you to go back to look at verse number 19. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. This is Jeremiah preaching because he's preaching of the destruction. That's why he's saying his bowels, his bowels, and that he's, going, he's preaching of war coming because he is, he is prophesying of coming destruction upon the nation of Israel. Look at verse 21. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. Who is that speaking of? Israel, of course, right? <clears throat> my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish. That means stupid. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Now look at this. I beheld. Same person speaking, right? Nothing changed. We're in the same context. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was, it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. Look at this, verse number 24. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and the hills moved lightly. I beheld, so he's saying he's looking, Jeremiah keeps saying he's looking. He's seeing a vision is what's going on. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. That's the only verse that we need to, to debunk this. It says, all the birds of the heavens were fled. When you flip back over to Genesis chapter number 1, I want you to look in verse number... Uh, verse number 21, I believe it is. Is that correct? No, that's where he creates movie creature. No, it's verse number 20. So he says, uh, <clears throat> verse 19, we'll read that first to get the content. In the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So notice on the fourth day, or when the birds or the fowls of the heaven are created. So if we go back here to Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 2, are there birds present? Have birds even been created yet? No. So there is no possibility. The probability is zero that these verses can be cross-referenced to one another. You know why? Because the birds weren't even created yet. When Jeremiah is looking, he's looking at the destruction. And you know why there's, you know, the earth is without form and void? Because everything's been destroyed. That's why. He starts to explain how the mountains and the hills are rolling and there's earthquakes. He, he says there's no man. Why is there no man? Because God had destroyed all the men of Israel. Why have the earth, how, why have the, the, the fowl fled? Why? Because there was such a great natural, you know, disaster, a catastrophe that took place that even the animals fled from that area. You know, that will happen when there are, or there are massive earthquakes. All the animals will leave, obviously, as well. They're fleeing as well. When there's something, you know, they can recognize and understand from their natural senses that there's something wrong. And they will leave. They will flee. So we can see clearly just by looking at the context. It's very simple to see. Yeah, they're both without form and void. There are many things that I could describe being without form and void. That doesn't mean we're talking about the same event. And just a little bit of context disproves that. <laughs> now, now, I'm going to show you one other verse that further disproves this. And this also disproves what is known as the day-age theory. I want you to go to Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 11. So as I said, the gap theory which is taught by many people, taught by especially Ruckmanites, the Schofield Reference Bible teaches the gap theory. The gap theory teaches that there is, you know, a, a, an unknown amount of time between Genesis chapter number 1 and Genesis chapter number 2 and that there was a, a, a pre-Adamite civilization. That is a civilization that lived upon this earth before Adam. And the only purpose of this is to compromise the Bible with modern day science. The Bible with evolution. You know, they want to compromise all of the dating methods that they use. Carbon dating. Well, yeah, it can be millions of years because there's a big gap here in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter number uh, chapter number 1, verse 1 through 2. 
So they want to compromise the two, evolution, and then they also use that, well, the dinosaurs, that's because there were, you know, these other creatures during the pre-Adamite civilization. Notice when they create this civilization, everything that they say is in it are things that they need to compromise the Bible's position with evolution. That's not a coincidence. That's because that's the whole purpose that it was invented in the first place. Now, <clears throat> I want you to look here at Exodus chapter number 20. I want you to look at verse number 11. Exodus chapter number 20, look at verse number 11. The Bible says this. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And then it says this, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, theistic evolutionists, what they will try to say is that these six days are not six literal days, but they are long periods of time. As in, you know, the first day is 200,000 years. And then the third day is 4 million years. Whatever they, number they want to make up. They just make up these numbers and just throw these numbers out there, right? The fourth day is this amount of time. That is what is known as, that would be a theistic evolutionist view. And it is the day-age theory. But we can very clearly disprove that by this passage in and of itself where it says... In six days that God created the earth. Very clearly, for in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested, and rested the seventh day. You say, well, how does this, how does this debunk that view? You can say, oh, I see how it debunks, debunks the view of the gap theory, right? Because it just says six days and then seven, right? Well, the same philosophy, the same logic actually debunks the, debunks the other one. Because what is he likening the seven days unto? A regular seven-day week, right? He is telling them that you need to honor the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day at the end of your week, just like when God created the earth in six days and then rested on the seventh day. That's why it debunks both the gap theory and the day-age theory, both of them. Just this one verse here. Because he's saying in the same way that you have a week with seven days, I want you to rest on your seventh day, just like when I created the world in six weeks. I worked for those six days, you work for six days in the same manner, and then you rest on the last day. Does that make sense? That's what he's liking it unto. So the whole purpose of this is to explain to you that the same way that I did this, this is how I want you to do that. So he's likening the two. Therefore, both of those right there are debunked very simply with just exit. You don't even need to turn the person that believes the gap theory. You don't even need to turn them to Jeremiah 4. You just take them to Exodus chapter 20, verse number 11, and it's game over right there. Go back to Genesis chapter number 1. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 1. So we have there again in verse number 2. And the earth was without form and void. So there's nothing. It's saying it's without form. There aren't mountains, there aren't hills. It's without form because it is just a body of water, right? Just the planet earth. It's a body of water and it's void because there's nothing in it yet. God has not created anything yet in it. So it's without form and void. And then it says, and darkness was upon the face of of the deep. Now, face of the deep is always referring to the sea, to the oceans, because there's water there right now. And then it tells you also in the very, very next breath, the very next statement in that verse, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So we see the Holy Spirit there being referred to as the Spirit of God at the end of verse number two. Verse number three says this, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. The power of God's word creating the world. We're going to get into that a little bit more here in just a moment. But we can see by the method by which he creates things is that he just speaks. He says, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Verse 5, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So this is the first day here. And notice that it begins with the evening and the morning. One of the reasons, that, you know, I've never heard anyone else say this. I guess I kind of just read the Bible and come away with this. But I believe that, notice it's, it's in reverse order than we would consider a day, evening and morning. And, I, and that's also considered, you know, a, a day when you read through the Old Testament, when the Jews were keeping their day. They would refer to a day as being evening and morning. And I believe it's because there was darkness first. You understand what I'm saying? There was darkness first. That's what we would consider our evening is dark time, or, you know, nighttime, right? And then there's light in this sense. It's evening and then it's morning. That's just my reading that I've come away with it as because he, God creates everything. There's a period of darkness and then he creates the light. So it's the evening and then it's the morning first. So he says the evening and the morning were the first day. And the calendar, like I said, in the Old Testament of the Jews actually followed that same pattern, the evening and the morning. 
in that order. <clears throat> Verse number five, again, it says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. It's very, the book of Genesis is very foundational, like I mentioned already. Notice how day and night are both capitalized. God does that when he's calling something, something, where he says, like in Isaiah chapter number nine, verse number six, those are all names. Therefore, he capitalizes all of that. That's why day is capitalized here, because he's saying he called it this. This is a name, right? It says, and God called the light day, and it says, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, I mentioned it being foundational because I wanted to make another point. The Bible, there, there's uh, such a thing that people have believed the Bible that they, they use this term. It's called the, the, uh, the rule of first mention or the law of first mention. Anybody heard that before? Yeah. The law of first mention is, is if you look up a word the very first time that appears in the Bible, you're almost for sure going to get the definition of it. Here in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, which is the beginning of the Bible, since that pattern, since we know the Bible has that pattern, the first time a word is mentioned, the God defines it. Here in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, or chapter number 1 in general, we're going to see him defining things repeatedly. So right here, like he says, and God called, look at this, the light day. So he defines the light there for you, day, and then it says, and the darkness he called night. So the period of time when the light is out, that is day. The period of time when the darkness is upon the earth, that is considered night. It says in the evening and the morning of the first day. Verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 1. Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 1. We can get the, the definition of the firmament. Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 1. Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 1. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So notice that. What it, what it uses interchangeably here is heavens... And firmament. That is the definition of firmament is heavens. Notice how it's plural here though again. Heavens and then firmament, right? I want you to go back again to Genesis chapter number one. So when we see there in verse number six, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. That is referring to the heavens or the heaven. When you look down at verse number eight, you also get the definition of it there as well. And God called the firmament heaven. So we see the definition of firmament actually means heaven, referring to space. Just, it's just a, a, an area of space where nothing, no objects or anything are, are in that particularly. So right there in verse number 8, we'll, we'll conclude. And the evening and the morning were, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't read verse number 8 in its entirety. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the, were the second day. Verse number 9, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear and it was so. So notice he gathers all the waters together, and then the dry land at this point also appeared. So this would be the third day that this took place. Look at verse number 10. And God called the dry land earth. So right there we get a definition of dry land in the Bible is earth. And a good example of this is in Revelation chapter number 7. You don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you very quickly. But it's, it's, uh, you, you have two examples of it. It words it in two different ways. Revelation 7, 1 it says this, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So notice that there's a distinction made between the earth, the sea, and trees, because the earth there is dry land. Saying he's sta that he's, he's standing on the earth, and he's standing there holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind would not blow on the earth, that's the dry land, nor the sea. Therefore, the sea and the earth here in this case are two different things. And then he says, nor on any tree. That's again spoken of in verse number two. I, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Notice again, they're two different things. Just like, and you can see that this is not repeating the same thing by comparing it to the verse before. The earth nor the sea, the earth and the sea. Just like we see in Genesis chapter 1, we get a definition of earth. It's dry land. There's examples also in the Bible where when people are mourning, they, you know, they will put uh, earth on their head. It's obviously not speaking of the planet. It's talking about it's, they're gathering up dirt, if you will, dry, grant, dry uh, land and putting that on their head. So it says there, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. 
and God saw that it was good. It's not talking about rivers, of course. It's talking about the areas where the waters are gathered together in large quantities, right? We mostly refer to it as, as oceans, right? But large quantities, and it's not just the ocean here. Of course, we have the Mediterranean Sea and over in the Middle East area as well. The Red Sea, things like that. It's just large areas of water is what he's referring to here, where waters, mass quantities of waters are gathered together. God refers to that as sea. Notice the pattern again of defining everything that's mentioned. That's because it's the very beginning of the Bible. That's, that's again the law of first mention. Look there in verse number 11. The Bible says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass. The herbs, that would be plants, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. And then it says this, Whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So you can see, you know, the, the, just the, the greatness of God and his, and his wisdom. When he creates something, he makes whatever this particular product is, whatever this particular creation is, he makes it with the ability to be able to, to, to recreate, to, du to duplicate itself, self-duplicating system, right? Where he actually puts the seed within the very first creation of whatever it may be. Grass, herb bearing seed, right? And then fruit trees bearing fruit. So he puts that seed, and that's an amazing concept. We kind of look over a lot of the depths of science, of just how the very first tree, you know, God went ahead and he created in the apples or in the oranges or in the pears, whatever particular plant or fruit tree you want to refer to. But he went ahead and he put a seed inside of every single one of those so that it could reproduce and make another tree later on. I mean, that's an amazing thought. We just look over the science. And let me say this, you know, the Bible... Of course, we get our religious faith from the Bible. We get our religious practices from the Bible. We get our philosophies, right? Our logic, the way we view the world, right? From the Bible. But I also get my history from the Bible. It starts here. When I, if I go and study history somewhere else, if it conflicts with this book, this is truth right here. If it conflicts with this book, I throw it out. And I go with this. Same, same deal with science. I get my science. My science. This is my first science book right here. People may mock and laugh at that. I don't care even a tiny bit. This, yeah. Thy word is truth. Every word in this book, it's written from the creator. If I want to learn about the creation, I'm going to read the creator's book. And I'm going to let him tell me how he created everything and in what way. There's so much science in the Bible that was, there's so many things about science in the Bible that were revealed that people didn't discover till much later. You know, uh, you know, diseases that harmed people, where people caught diseases, they didn't know how to get rid of them. They lived very unsanitary lives because they weren't following the practices, you know, the sanitary practices that the Bible laid out. People got sick and people were, you know, uh, and died from those types of things. But all along, all they had to do was follow the Creator's rules that were laid out in the Old Testament, which, you know, were, were clearly... True science. They always, always. I want you to look here in verse number, uh, let's begin in verse number 13 again. The Bible says, in the evening and the morning were the third day. So notice there on the third day, he created all the plants and he also made the dry land to appear. He created the plants, the grass, and the trees, and he made the dry land to appear just prior to that, of course. Verse number 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. <clears throat> Verse 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Verse 16. It's repeating the same thing. And God made two great lights. This is, of course, the sun and the moon. The greater light to rule the day, that would be the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, that is the moon. And then it says, and he made the stars also. These are all four, as it reads above that, for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And many people in many different cultures throughout time have based their calendars and everything upon the stars because there's a specific pattern that they follow repeatedly, a routine that they go, that they do not break that routine. Uh, continue looking. That's the whole purpose of the stars, the Bible tells us, and, and the sun and the moon. Look at verse number 17. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So that's the main purpose is to give light upon the earth. Verse 18. And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. I don't know if you ever noticed this, ever thought about this in your Bible reading. 
But the light in verse number 14 that is created, the light, of course, of the sun, moon, and stars, actually replaces a light that was created prior to this. And there's you know, many different discussions about what this light is, what this light could have been. But if you look up and remember what we read earlier, verse number four, verse number uh, three, actually, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. That is not the sun, and that's not the moon, and that is not the stars. The sun, moon, and stars are created much later. Has everyone noticed that before here in the Bible? The sun, moon, and stars are created much later. But right here, when God says, let there be light, and there was light, this is not the sun, moon, and star. This, to me, I would say that this is probably just some sort of light that's radiating from God. I don't know for sure what this is. Many different people have, you know, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they've come up with their own, they theorized about what this could have been, or, you know, made up different, you know, uh, different ideas of what this could be. I don't know in particular, but I would say this. The reason why I believe that this is a light coming from God is because if you compare the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, there are tons of similarities, just tons of similarities. If the Bible really comes full circle, and this comes back again to why I believe that the Bible is in a perfect order as far as the books. When you read the book of Genesis and you read about, you know, where paradise is, the Garden of Eden, the river, the, you know, the, the, the tree of life, God is there. There's communion between God and man. He's able to speak to them. They go on walks, right? It's almost identical to the book of Revelation when paradise is revealed. The tree of life is there. The river is there. The Bible says that God is there. The Lord is there. There are tons of other similarities. And do you know who the light is in the book of Revelation at the very end? The Lamb. God is the light. So you know what I believe this light is? It's God. That makes the most sense to me. Not only because of that, but notice what it says in the way that this is worded. It says in verse 4, And God saw the light, that it was good. And then it says, And God divided the light from the darkness. Is the darkness good? No, I believe that this is, this is a, you know, a, a, an allusion to, to righteousness and unrighteousness. And what's good is God is good. You know, the, the light in the Bible is, is who? Who does it say is the light of the world? It's Jesus. The light in the Bible represents goodness. Darkness represents bad things. Darkness represents sin and evil. Notice, when he creates the light, the light is good. The darkness is not good. He doesn't say that the darkness is good, does he? But he specifically makes sure that he tells you that the, that the light is good. I believe that this is speaking of possibly the Lord Jesus Christ being the light. God being the light. I think that makes the most sense of anything that I've ever heard. Look back down again. <clears throat> Go back to, uh, where did we leave off there? I guess it was verse number 19. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. I want you to notice where these, where these creatures are coming from. They're coming directly straight out of the water. So God created the waters, the seas, right? And then out of this, he's creating the creatures. They literally just come out of the, the, uh, the water here. Notice the creatures that, that are created. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. And he says, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. I always thought that's interesting that it's not only the creatures of the waters, but also he creates the fowls of the heaven from the waters, which is interesting because that's not necessarily their habitat, right? So it says that, that they may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven, verse 21, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. So this is all of the sea creatures. And then it says this, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So we have all the sea creatures, and then we have all of the creatures that we would consider birds, right? Uh, the, those that would fly in the heavens. Look at verse number 22. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. So we see that God wants the earth to be filled. That's something we can learn from this philosophy-wise, right? That God wants the earth to be filled. He's blessing them and saying that he wants them to multiply in the earth. Verse number 23. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. So now out of the earth, these animals are being created. He created the, the sea creatures and the fowls out of the sea. Now he's creating the, the creatures that will be on land, right? Dry land animals. He's creating them directly out of the earth. Look at what it says there. <clears throat> let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. 
cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Now this right here, like I said, the, the book of Genesis is very foundational. This right here is the category or are the categories that animals are broken down into throughout the entire Bible. Everything is defined. The book of Genesis is crucial. It's essential to understanding the Bible. It really is the foundation of the Bible. So you have cattle. That would be like a ruminant animals, like animals that are that that are domesticated that we use for you know meat and uh, that we that we get different things from. Sheep, obviously, you would get their wool. So there would be ruminant animals like we would say you know cow, but many other animals other than cows fall into the category. Cows is actually like more of like a colloquial word. It's not. Does everybody know that's not actually even correct? It kind of came over time. Cows is, is uh, the, the correct term for cows is bovine. That's really the correct term. Cows is not the correct term. Cow actually means female. Did everybody know that? You, you like like uh, a manatee, the woman manatee, the female manatee is a cow. Uh, moose, female moose is, is also known as a cow. Cow is a, it's colloquial. It's kind of like, a, everybody know what colloquial means? Like layman's terms, kind of. It's just like the, the it's just like the, ran, it's kind of like the random man kind of corrupted the language over time. Probably everybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about right now, I'm just kidding, I'm just joking. But yeah, that's colloquial is what that, that, that word means. But it's, it's, you know, cattle is all creatures that, that people have domesticated and used, and normally they're horned with hooves, right? You know, bison even would fall into this category. You know, uh, cows, like I said, um, goats, sheep, of course, all those animals are referred to as cattle all throughout the Bible. So when someone's keeping cattle, a lot of the time, if it's the nation of Israel, what are they keeping? Sheep. But they'll refer to them as cattle, right? It's not always just cows, right? Then we have after the cattle is mentioned there, we have creeping things. I want you to turn just so this is a, a good place to get a definition of creeping things. Leviticus 11, 21, when the dietary restrictions are given in the Bible. Go to Leviticus chapter number 11, verse number 21. Just two books to the right. Leviticus 11, verse number 21. <clears throat> Leviticus 11, verse number, I believe it's verse 21. Yeah, verse number 21 says this. Yet these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap with all upon the earth. So now he's going to define for us what creeping things are, right? Like I said, it's the same language that's used all throughout the Bible is defined for you in the very beginning of Genesis 1. It's a foundational book. It says in verse uh, 22 there, Even these of them you may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind, but all other flying, creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. you skip down. Uh, and then, you know, if you look at verse 26, you know, he starts talking about things that are cloven-footed. These would fall into the example of, uh, you know, uh, other dry land animals. Like, we'll skip over that. It's not relevant right now. So go back to Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 24. So when we saw that creeping things, that, you know, it, that also covers animals that are snakes as well, fall into the cattle category of, uh, of creeping things in the Bible. So we see bugs, things along those lines, you know, locusts, uh, beetles, you know, ants. Those would all be creeping things, things that would their, their stomach basically would drag while they, whether they walk or slither. These are all creeping things, right? So we have cattle, creeping things, and it says, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. Beasts of the earth normally refer to animals that are normally like the, you know, the predator. Like the lion is very often referred to as a beast of the earth. Normally a, a great strong animal like a lion, like I said is a beast of the earth. It says, after his kind. Notice evolution is just being debunked by every verse that we're reading right now. Right. After he creates something, you know what he says? I'm creating this kind of animal that it will, that it will reproduce other animals after its kind. Mm -hmm. Repeatedly, over and over and over again. After his kind, after his kind, after his kind, after his kind. Leaving no room for evolution. Number one, all the animals are fully formed in the very beginning. Right. That debunks evolution. Man. But not only that, when God creates the animals and God creates all of the plants and everything, because evolution, I don't know if you understand this, but it's so dumb that it says that everything basically came from plants. Everything came from bananas. Everything came, you can trace like people all the way back, you know, to like, you know, bugs and then back to plants and back to trees even. It's so retarded. Right. I don't know how anybody could believe that garbage. It's so dumb. It's ridiculous. Man. But 
Not only does, is everything fully formed in the very beginning, everything is, is fully formed and fully created, and it can only reproduce after his kind. After his kind. So there's no room to believe the Bible and believe evolution. Right. You need to just have the attitude like I talked about. You know, This is why that sermon was important Sunday evening about why I'm a fundamentalist. You need to just believe the Bible for what it says. Even like Paul said, I believe the Lord even, you know, that, that it will happen even as he said it was going to happen. I just paraphrase that. But I just believe what it said. I just read Genesis 1, and I don't care whether scientists say that it conflicts or not. I just believe the Lord that it's going to happen. Just like I'm sure there's a lot of people on the boat with, with Paul, and they're like, that's, that's, that can't happen. That's impossible. That's a miracle. And Paul's just like, you know what? I just believe it anyways. You know what we have today are a lot of people that, they reject the Bible. They say that science contradicts the Bible, which real science does not. Real science is in line with the Bible. Real science, that is. Evolution is not real science. Evolution is faulty science. Evolution is hokey, is what it is. And the Bible says, when, when Paul was writing to Timothy, he says, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. And then he says this, Avoiding profane and vain babblings. Ba babblings. Right? You hear that? Avoiding profane and vain babblings. And then he, right after he says that, he says this. In oppositions of science falsely so-called. What does it sound like oppositions of science falsely so-called is, 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 is coupled with? Of profane and vain babblings. So what do you hear these people? That's all that they do. They just babble and they tell you, they want to go on and on. And they're just real, you know, long-winded. And they want to explain to you every act. But they don't understand anything. You know what it is? It's science. But it's falsely so-called science. Amen. There was falsely false science even at the time of Paul and Timothy, but it wasn't evolution. And the masses believed it, the majority believed it, and it was in opposition to the Bible, but it doesn't exist anymore today because it was false. You know what? Evolution is just like that science that Paul was warning Timothy about. It's false as well. Being in opposition to the Bible, because if you're in opposition to the Bible, you're wrong, period. Right. I don't need to be a scientist. I, all I have to do is just believe the, the, you know, the information from the... I have the right source. You know, I have the right textbook. Right? I just have the textbook that just tells me all the answers, evolutionists. Right. You can study all you want, but if you, don't understand, if you don't start with this being truth and this being your textbook, you're going to be in a world of mess. You're going to be wrong on every area of life. So we have to start with the Bible as our foundation in every area. Man, if you want to learn history, you start with the Bible. Understand the Bible's timeline. And you, you study something about, you know, the Roman period, the Greek age, the Hellenistic age, whatever it may be, the Iron Age. And you, you try to line it up with the Bible. And if they can't both fit, you take the man's history and you throw it out. Right. Maybe yeah. read another book. And if that lines up, well, that makes perfect sense, right? And there's been tons of findings, tons of archaeological findings and stuff that confirm the history of the Bible. Even historians will, will read the Bible and they'll use the Bible, not because they believe it, because they know that the, <clears throat> the history has been proven accurate in the Bible repeatedly, lining up with other civilizations. When the Israelites record history, and then there's other history with another civilization, and those particular civilizations, Israel and whoever it may be, they come together, they'll see sometimes that the history has coincided in both history books. And they found that over time, repeatedly, the history of the Bible is so accurate that they'll refer to the Bible now for, for, to have a good basis or a good reference point of accurate history, something that they know is accurate. Just would to God that all of these, these historians would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they'd be that much smarter when they go to study their history. Amen. And that's the first step is having true wisdom as your foundation. That is the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. Look there at verse number 25 now. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, I spent some time on verse 26. I know we went over this a couple of times, but I want to hit on it again just because it's so important. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. <clears throat> so let's stop right there. Number one, I want you to go over again to John chapter number one, verse number one. John chapter number one, verse number one. So we saw the parallel with John 1.1 1, 1 already and Genesis 1. I want to read a little bit here in John 1, a few, the first few verses. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we learned two things. Number one, the Word was with God. 
God's word was with him. God's word is alive and living, therefore it can dwell with him. It can dwell in his bosom. He can speak his word, right? And it can be inside of him. God's words are spirit. They're alive. They're with him. But not only that, God is his word at the same time. This is the understanding of the true trinity. At the same time that God's word's with him, God is his word. That's clear reading of this text. Whether you understand it or not, that's the clear reading of the text. The word is with God, and then that same word is God. There's only one God. It's not another God. Amen. The word is with God, and the word is God. The same time. Look at verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. Speaking of the word. Now look at verse number 3. It's important. All things were made by him. All things were made by him. Watch this. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now I want to make a point that I don't know if I ever made, made it in this particular way when we looked at this last time, but... Notice what it says in verse number three. All things were made by him, and without him, that means without the word, without him, there was not anything made that was made. That's saying that nothing was made without him. It's just another way of saying that nothing was made without the word, right? So every single thing was made by God and his word, right? We look back in Genesis chapter number one, and we see that everything is created in what manner, by what method. God said. So what do we see? God and then his word. It's exactly what John 1.1 1, 1 teaches, right? John 1.1 1, 1 through 1.3 there, actually. That God is there and that his word is with him. Now, notice what that verse says, that all things were made by him. The word, right, and God. And without him, there was not anything made that was made. That means when I look at Genesis 1.3, that is the verse that says, and God said, let there be light. That's exactly the same as Genesis 1.26. Let that sink in for a minute. All things were made by him. And without him, there was not anything made that was made. So everything, every single thing was made in the same way. Because it was made by him, there was nothing that wasn't made by him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand why this is very important to understand? So everything was made by the word and by God and his word being spoken. Therefore, if I look at Genesis 1, if Genesis 1, 26 seems to be a little confusing, well, I already know that everything was created the same way by John 1, 3. So all I have to do is go back to all of the other times in Genesis chapter number 1 and we can look over those and see how everything else was created. So go back to Genesis chapter number 1. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 3. And God said... Let there be light. And there was light. How did God create this? Speaking, right? Look at verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. How did he create this? By speaking. It's his word, right? Look at verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven. Notice, God said his word. He spoke. He created it by his word, right? <clears throat> verse number uh, 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Notice again, he spoke. Look at verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Are you noticing a pattern? Doesn't this coincide with John 1, 3? All things were made by him. Without him, there was not anything made that was made. So the same manner of everything being created in Genesis chapter 1, you know, carries on out through, through the end of the whole chapter. Every single thing was created by God and his word. So there's no difference in the creation, right? How many people are speaking? It doesn't say God said. It says God said. God said, let there be light. One God, right? One God is speaking, and God said, let there be light. Okay, you continue on. Let's look at this again just so that we see the consistency. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. I believe there's one more time. Yeah, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. We have one person speaking, one God, and words coming out of his mouth. We look at John 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible tells us that all things were created by him. Who are we talking about? God and his Word, right? We go back to Genesis chapter number 1, and it says, and God said, let there be light. One God, one person speaking. Makes perfect, perfect sense. Then we look at the consistency of how everything's created, and each time he speaks, and he says, let there be light. Notice the word let. Look there again in Genesis 1.26. We continue that same pattern, right? What's, what took place in Genesis 1.26 without, without even looking at this? What took place in all the other verses? How was everything created? One God, one person, right? Him and his word. 
We know that that's the case because all things were created by him. Without him, there was not anything made that was made. Same person speaking, him, singular, one person spoke, and his word, him, his word is speaking, right? That's it. He is speaking his word. Let me rephrase that so lest anyone think that I'm a, a, a Trinitarian in that sense, the Orthodox Trinitarian. Notice what it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So people look there and they see our, and I want to deal with this for just a minute. And God said, let us make man in our image. They see, see that the, there must be, you know, a multitude of people here, right? They try to use this to prove that there are three persons in the Godhead. So, number one, even if that were true, which it's not, this is not a supporting text. This is not a proof text. This could only, at the most, be a supporting text. That's the most that it could possibly be. But when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we debunk that. We can see that that's not the case, that His Word is there. And the Bible actually points you to that Scripture. That's the purpose. Keep that in mind when you read your Bible. John 1.1, 1, 1, that's the purpose of that passage, is to tell you that there's something going on there. There is, a, there is a triune nature in God. We can see that again by comparing 1 John 5, 7. That there's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. There, is, there are three, but it's one person, right. right? Just like in 1 John 5, right after that, you have the Spirit and the water. You have the, yeah, the Spirit and the water and the blood. That's one person. They're all three bearing record. They all agree in one. Just like the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That's one person, right? And you have His actual Word. So if someone were to try to use this text, the most that they can prove by this is that there are two people there. And they don't know who they are. They don't know who's being spoken to. My point is this. This is not a proof text by any means. This, at the most, could be a supporting text, right? But it's already been debunked. When you compare Scripture to Scripture, we can see that who was there was His Word. Him, His Word, and His Spirit, His spoken Word. Before we go anywhere else, while we're still on the topic real quick of the word specifically, I want to prove you further that it's the literal word. Go to Psalm 33, verse 6. Psalm 33, verse 6. And there's one other verse that I want to show you. It's very interesting on this topic. Look at Psalm 33, verse 6. Psalm 33, verse 6. The Bible just clear as day shows you that it is the literal word of God. Amen. Look at verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them, look at this, by the breath of his mouth. Just in case you didn't understand that this is not a person, the word of the Lord, guess what? It was made by the breath of his mouth. Amen. When he breathed, he spoke the word of God. Amen. That is the way in which the world was created by God's word. Through faith, we understand that the world, worlds were framed by the word of God. Hebrews 11, 3, I believe it is. Amen. That's how the world was created. I believe that through faith, by the word of the Lord, everything was made. Amen. And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Just believe John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Just believe the Bible. Just like, you know, I'm a fundamentalist. Well, then just believe what the Bible says. Amen. Believe, what, believe what, like what Paul said. I just believe that it's just how God said that it was. You don't have to interpret it. You don't have to go back to Greek philosophy. Oh, the Word is another person. No, it's not. The Word is the Word, just like always. I don't need people to redefine words for me. Now, I want you to go back again. Drop a uh, psalm. The book of Psalms there. Why don't you go back again here in, in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 27. I have an example for you where a person, and it's God, who uh, actually speaks in plurality. He speaks in plurality, and not only does he speak in plurality, but he actually uses the word our. I want you to go to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Now, somebody had brought this up to me. I can't remember who exactly it was. And... Uh, it was oh, within the past year, somebody brought this up to me, and, and I shot them down because I had noticed this, but I had a different understanding of it the first time that I looked at it, and I was wrong. And I shot that person down, I don't remember who it was, and I explained to them my understanding, and they, they were like, oh, I see what you're saying, I guess, yeah, it is saying that. When I was at, I was actually the one who was wrong, I can't remember who it was. But uh, here in John chapter number 3, we have an example of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, and he himself actually speaks in plurality. And I'm going to prove to you that he's not talking about another human being. But just one person, everybody would agree that Jesus Christ is just one person. He's just one person, right? right. 
Because even the Trinitarians say, Orthodox Trinitarians say, he's the second person. One of three of the Godhead, right? He's the second person of the Godhead. Well, I want you to look at John chapter number three. I want you to look first at verse number nine. Jesus answered, speaking to Nicodemus for context, Jesus answered and said to him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Now, the first time somebody showed this to me, I was like, he's talking about John the Baptist or other people that are just preaching with him. But that's not what's going on right here. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute. What you have right now is the Lord Jesus Christ standing here. You have the Lord Jesus Christ standing here, and he's preaching to Nicodemus. And when he says we and our here, he is speaking in plurality about himself. Because you've got to keep in mind, Jesus Christ is the word, right? But Jesus Christ is also God, isn't he? So at the same time, and, and, and how is Jesus Christ conceived? By the Holy Spirit. So do you know what you have in Jesus Christ? The fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So in the same way in which God spoke in plurality in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 26, He spoke in plurality revealing His triune nature. That's what one reason why He did that. That was a revelation of His triune nature, which was further understood by comparing John chapter number 1. When John wrote John 1... You, that shed, that shed more, much more light on Genesis 1.26. Not only that, it is prophetic. I'm going to explain a couple things before we go deeper here. It was prophetic of his word being made flesh. That's why that particular time he brought up, you know, he, or he made the statement of plurality, let us make man in our image. How in which was he creating things? The word. Right? So it was him and his word creating everything. Right? So he said, let us, speaking about his word, him, his spirit, and his word, let us make man in our image. But even further of why he did that was because at this moment he's creating him in his image. And his word would one day be made flesh and be the express image of God the Father's person. Amen. Right? So we can see that clearly all perfectly lining up, making perfect sense when we just believe the Bible for what it says. But I, my original interpretation of verse number 11 was that he was speaking about him and John the Baptist or him and another person. But I'm going to show you that's not what he's talking about. And I want you to keep in mind, do you remember in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 26, first it says, let us make man in our image, right? And, and after our likeness. In the following verse, what does it say? And God did what? In his, singular. So there again we have the, the, the confirmation and the reaffirmation that God is a singular person. So what we have is one image, period. How do you want to slice that verse? You have one image standing there in his own image. Notice that. His singular own. You can't get around that. His singular own. That's one image. So you have one image standing there saying, let us make man an hour. Right. However you interpret the verse, that's it. But notice how you see the plurality, but then you see the singularity. Right? I want you to look here in verse number 11 again. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. This is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. We, plural, speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. So notice he's saying, we speak that we know and testify that we have seen. So the plurality out here, Jesus is including himself in this group. It's third person, right? Or second person plural. So he's saying, we, no, it would be first person plural, I'm sorry. First person plural, we, him, and something else, right? Or someone else, right? Look at it in that sense. You just kind of start out uh, theoretically or hypothetically here. We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. And he says, and ye receive not our witness. Right? Look at verse number 12. If I, singular, have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So he's saying, if I told you earthly things and you didn't believe me, how are you going to believe me if I tell you of heavenly things? Right? Because he's Now, I want you to get the context here. He's talking to Nicodemus about things that he has seen because he's God in heaven. 
He's saying we can only, you know, he says in that sense that we speak that we do know. We speak the things that we know and we testify the things that we have, that we have seen. So we, we're speaking things that we've seen and we're speaking things that we have, uh, you know, we speak the things that we know and we speak the things that we've seen. And he says, and you receive not, he receive not our witness. So there's a witness of things that, that they, if you will, we, he says here, have seen, right, and have spoken, Right? Well, I want you to look at the very next verse, verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So this verse right here, just this is just like a nightmare to an Orthodox Trinitarian. It's just a nightmare. There's no way to get around it. Jesus says, point blank, that while he's talking to Nicodemus, I'm in heaven right now. Which is in heaven. Just like when he said to the thief on the cross, today you're going to be with me in paradise. But Jesus was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Why? Because he's God seated upon the throne all the same time. Amen. Nothing changed. We're really the only ones that believe that he never changed. Right. Really. Because if they believe that Jesus was in heaven, just the, as the second person of the Trinity, and it's talking about the second person of the Trinity, not the first person, not the third person, these three different people that they have, and the second person came down and then just like, you know, took on flesh, he's hungry, he's thirsty, all these things, they believe he changed, yeah, right. right? I believe that the Lord, the creator of all the earth, the creator of the ends of the earth, was seated in heaven. He came down to this earth through his word and remained unchanged upon the throne in heaven. Amen. Jesus, and that, and you know what? That was him manifesting himself to everyone on the earth. God manifests the flesh, and he's declaring his name. I've manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me, right? Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. That's him. That's the same one God. That's hungry, that's thirsty, but guess what? Jesus Christ, the Lord... The Lord Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Never changing. Right. Seated upon the throne without leaving. Now, if you are an Orthodox Trinitarian and you believe that, that the second person came down, did not remain in heaven, number one, you just flat out don't believe that verse. Because right. it says the Son of Man which is in heaven. You need to pick you up an NIV or New King James right. and she takes the witches in heaven out. Right. That's a little bit more accurate with your you know uh, interpretation of, of who God is, the Godhead. But number two, what we see here is, I just totally lost my train of thought. Does anybody know where I was going with that? It was good, too. I don't have any idea where I was going. The number one point is you don't believe that verse. I'm trying to spark my memory right now. You don't believe that verse which says it's just at all. Number two is you're the one that really believes that he changed. Because he didn't remain unchanged in heaven. There was a time in which he was different. But, but not same at the same time. You understand what I'm saying? Concurrently, he was not unchanged. So for your interpretation, Orthodox Trinitarian, you believe he changed. But I believe the Lord remained unchanged all throughout time, seated upon the throne. Amen. All throughout time. That's the only way you can believe that verse. That's the only way. So right there, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is heaven, that is him telling you that I'm from heaven. And, I, and he's saying that he knows the things from heaven, right? And I'm going to prove that to you. And I'm going to prove that he's not talking about John the Baptist or any other man. Because look, I want you to look over here in John chapter number 3. I want you to look at verse number 31. This is John the Baptist speaking. John chapter number 3, verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. Who are we talking about here? The Lord, right? Jesus, right? So he's saying, he that comes from above, he's above all. Amen. It kind of messes up your, your, your authority structure there. Right? Right. He that comes from above is above all. And then it says, he that is of the earth is earthly. Notice that. So he's making a, dis he's making a distinction between the earth and heaven. He's saying, he that's in heaven, he's above all. He that is of the earth is earthly. Now watch this. And speaketh of the earth. So man speaks of the earth, but he that's of heaven, what does he speak of? Say of heavenly things, right? Look what it says. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Look at verse 32. And what he, I want you to notice the singularity here all of a sudden. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. So it says what he, singular, speaking of Jesus, has seen and has heard that he, singular, testifies of. 
Go back to John chapter 3, verse number 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Our witness. And you know what's very interesting about this is he says right after that, the Son of Man which is in heaven. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The same Father, Word, and Holy Ghost, the same Lord and God that was seated on the throne, unchanged, was the same God with the fullness of the Godhead, Father, Word, and Holy Ghost walking on this earth. Amen. That's why that God can say, I bear record of myself. And then he can also say, another one bears record of me. Because the same God in heaven bore record. The same God on earth bore record of himself. Amen. Notice the singularity and the plurality. How many people you got speaking? One person. One person speaking, but you know what he does? He speaks in plurality. We speak that we do know and testify that you have seen, and you receive not our witness. Yes. And he says, if I tell you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe me if I tell you of heavenly things? You look over at John the Baptist when he's talking, it says he's above all. He that's of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. But he that's of heaven, he, he, spe he speaks of things that are in heaven. So the ones that are speaking right here in verse number 11, those that, when it says, we speak that we do know, do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness, that's Jesus Christ, one person speaking in plurality, saying, ye receive not our witness. And then he says, the Son of Man which is in heaven. 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Amen. I strongly believe that God has a triune nature. And I believe that if, you, if someone accepts that there is just one God and he does not have a triune nature, that is false doctrine. That's, that is not a small error. We put the emphasis on the oneness of God because God puts the emphasis on that. But it is a major error to not believe in the triune nature of God. You will mess up the Bible bad when you start getting into stuff like that. That, let us make man in our image, that is the triune nature of God. And the New Testament points you to that repeatedly. I mean, that's the whole purpose of John 1. It, in the beginning... Same statement, in the beginning, right? So he's telling you, go back and read. You read and see how he created everything, and God said, and God said, and God said. And John 1, 1 tells you, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You read him speaking in singularity, and God said, and God said, and he even says let. And God said let, and God said let, and God said let. You see this pattern over and over and over again. And then you see him say, and God said, let us make man in our image, and after our likeness. And then right after that, he wants to reaffirm the singularity of the one true God being one person. It says, and God made man in his own image. And then it's all clarified. You get to John 1, and what do you have? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have a clear passage of the man Christ Jesus, God in the flesh, walking on this earth. And he said, you receive not our witness fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. And then he references right after that the Son of Man which is in heaven. During that period of time, because the Word is specifically the Word. When you read 1 John chapter number 5, the three that are in heaven, they're bearing record of the Son of God on earth. That's the man Christ Jesus on earth. People always say, well that Word there, that's just the second person. No, it's not. That is the actual Word. That is the actual Word. Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Scriptures are actual words that are spoken. They are what testify. In 1 John 5, verse 7, that's the Father, His spoken word, and the Holy Spirit. That's what that is. And we have a clear example here in John chapter number 3, where Jesus Christ speaks in plurality. Jesus Christ speaks in plurality, so that's not out of God's, you know, uh, what, what's the correct word, character. That's not out of God's character to do such a thing as one person and just say, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. All things that are written are written for your benefit anyways. He spoke in plurality for your benefit, so that he would reveal unto you that he has a triune nature. That he would reveal unto you that he has a triune nature, and it's prophetic because, I want to hurry through these last uh, couple of points here. 
I'll tell you another reason why it's prophetic and prove it to you. Because it says here in, in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So when God creates man, the first thing's out of his mouth, out of his mouth, you know, one mouth his, right after that, as he says, now I want you to have dominion over all the earth. Everything. I'm going to give man dominion over all the earth. I want you to turn to Psalm, I believe it's chapter number 8. Psalm chapter number 8, verse number 4. It's actually quoted twice in the book of Psalms, the same uh, statement. Psalm chapter number 8, look at verse number 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Watch this, verse 5. For thou hast made him, excuse me, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Watch this, verse 6. Thou madest him? To have dominion over the works of thy hands. Doesn't that correspond with what we just read in Genesis 126? And if you know your Bible, who is this a prophecy of? The Lord Jesus Christ. So notice, when God is creating man in his own image, what is the image of God? Jesus Christ. He's creating him by his word. Let us make man in our image. He's creating him with, with you know, the word of God is what is actually doing it. But when he creates them, the very first thing out of his mouth is, we're going to give man, you know, the dominion, oh, dominion over all the earth, right? And man is made in the image of God. And you know why he says that? Because this is all prophetic of the man Christ Jesus to come who would receive dominion over everything ultimately. This right here is a prophecy of specifically the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what he says when he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ even. He says... For thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. That's even a secondary application to 1 Corinthians 15. Referring to humanity there. In 1 Corinthians 15 we see it talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over again. And he gave dominion because one day, I want you to listen to this. He gave dominion unto man right there after he creates him in his own image. Because God would someday through his word be born on this earth as a man. And he ordained that he, through that man, would have dominion over all the earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why that is referenced right here specifically. See all the emphasis right here on what we would call the Trinity, the plurality? And who's it pointing to? The Lord Jesus Christ. His word specifically created. And then it, it, it just shows you up in verse 27, Genesis 127, that God is a singular person. We don't have time to turn to the, the verses, but there are two clear verses that prove that God is a singular person. And he, uh, Job 13, 8 being the clearest. Look at uh, verse 27 again. So God created man in his own, his own, singular own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we see that God gave dominion over everything to man. <clears throat> Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is a, a, a fruit is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. So notice at this point they're not eating the animals. They're only eating fruits, uh, uh, the, the, the herbs and things like that. Then he says in verse 30, and to every beast of the earth. So he's saying that, and to them also he's giving them the herbs and the plants and the, the fruits and things like that. So the animals also are not eating you know, uh, they're not eating flesh or meat at this point. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything. So everything, nothing is, is uh, carnivorous at this point, carnivorous at this point. Everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me. And it was so. So there, there are, no one is eating flesh or eating meat. Nothing is carnivorous at this point. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we see in six days, God created everything. Everything's done, right? And at the very end of it, God said that it was very good. Notice he said it was good all the times prior to this. It's interesting. And then this last time, God looks at it. Think about God looking at something and saying it's very good. You may work on something. I might work on that wall back there and have a little bit of pride or something creep in and say, it's pretty good right there. But if God looks at something, and God not only says that's good, God says that's very good, you know what that means? 
It's very good. Yeah. Right? It's very good. It really is good. We may look at something, if God looked at it, he'd be like, man, goodness sakes, he'd pull a level out like, what in the world are you doing? Right? But when God makes something, God makes it perfect. Amen. God made, and you, I, I know right now that this was perfect and it was pure and it was, you know, it was paradise because God at the end of all of it looked at it and said, that is very good. That's a cool thought, man. That's a cool thought. God looked at his creation. He's all done. Everything's been created. And he said, that's very good. That's a great God that we serve. Amen. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. All throughout the Psalms, you see David repeatedly just praising God for the wonders of his handiworks, for the firmament, and how beautiful the heavens are. And truly, science does not have, have even a slightest grasp on the greatness and the vastness of the wisdom that was put into our creation. They, you know, they know so little, even of that which they are right about, they know very little about the depths of God's wisdom that went into this creation. They may look at it and say it's pretty good. God looks at it and says there's very, it's very good. Just recently, you have to think of just recently all the new discoveries of DNA. All these things that people for, you know, you know, just thousands of years had no idea about. And you think that that's all that there is to discover? You think we found everything? No way. There's so much more. It's so much deeper than we can even comprehend. There's so many other mechanisms and, and, and just, you know, different types of things that just run this universe that we have no clue about. And God looked at it and said, it's very good. We serve a great God. Inspire us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the book of Genesis. We thank you for giving us the record of creation, dear Lord. Help us just to read your word, just to believe it simply with child faith. And help us to be fundamentalists, to actually believe your word. We thank you, dear Lord God, for all the cross-references that we can make. We thank you for just... Being not a God of confusion, uh, dear Lord, uh, we, and we thank you for even giving us the admonition to study so that we're not confused and putting all of the, the passages in there to cross-reference so that we wouldn't be confused. We love you, dear Lord, and we know that you, that you want us to understand your word. We ask you that you would help us to be diligent while we study the book of, of Genesis and that you would also uh, guide myself and all those that are hearing with the Holy Spirit that we might understand all truth. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.